So quick audio check. Am I audible in the back? Closer. Let's try it like this. Audible. Okay. Let's start then. Um, because maybe ING is not that well known in Italy. Out at this part, my name is Johan Hutting. I work as a developer uh, at ING most of the time, about 80% of my time. ING is the largest bank in the Netherlands. We are well, working in several countries worldwide. And for Italy, we are a challenger bank, which means we don't have real offices. We do have people working here, but we don't have any bank uh, departments where you can just walk into a bank. We only have people coding stuff and doing the financial uh, services within uh, Italy. However, whenever I talk to people, it's like, what do you do for work? And it's, yeah, I develop things and I talk about them. And as of last year, I'm also promoting engineering culture because that's something that's lacking lately. And also open source is part of that. That's also engineering culture, showing what you can do, what you can achieve, and actually sharing that with people and with the community, helping others get along and also improving yourself by using open source, hence this talk. So my journey to open sourcing a library, and I put my library between quotes because it's no longer my library. Once I start to upload it, it's open source. Everyone can uh, copy it or they can adjust it or suggest improvements. We'll also cover the part of maintenance because that's part of the journey of open sourcing some software. Well, the main point in the the, the final part is the publishing because that was a challenge. People told me like, oh yeah, you shouldn't do this. It will take so much effort. It will be hard to do. Hence also the name of the talk. We'll see how it works out. And I will include those parts and takeaways in the end. So if you look at open source, why would you do open source? And part of that is so you can of course show off how well you are in your skill set, but also learn from that and improve yourself in what you're doing because you will get feedback from people. And that's the second point. You will get a much broader feedback because typically you're working in the office with a small team of colleagues, maybe some teams around you, and that's the kind of people that give you direct feedback. If you open source software, you will get a much broader audience that will look at your source code and start re replying to that or even suggesting improvements or request features that you don't have yet. Maybe you didn't think of them yet. It will help you out. And it will also help you out in your normal work. So that's also the collaboration with other developers that you normally don't meet. Another nice element is that you can actually inspire artists. Um, I will also cover it in my talk later on, but my original code was built for Java 17. I had to move to Java 21. So I used uh, some tooling to easily migrate it's, it's called Open Rewrite. Maybe some of you heard of it. And when one of my colleagues came to me a month ago, like, hey, I want to migrate to Java 21. What should I do? I just showed him the example because it's open source. I could just send him a link. Look at this. It's interesting. You can use this. And he came back a day later that he actually used it and learned a lot from it. So those are nice things about open source. There are, however, also some, some downsides. And, well, most of you might have heard of the exit uh, issue we had almost one and a half months, two months ago, where one of the, and that's a good connection with the previous talk, one of the engineers was working on this project. He was the only one. He had a depression and they started pushing him. It was an important library and he let someone else also commit to that code. And they almost managed to release malware within, within Linux, affecting, well, basically all servers around the world. We were quite lucky that someone found out there was a performance dip started looking into it and found out that someone actually tried to backdoor that piece of code. So we could act in time. If it didn't happen, we would probably have an issue by now in basically all servers connected to the internet. So why open source stuff? For me, the motivation is also, I want to challenge myself once in a while. I don't do this every year. I don't have year goals. I have goals for myself like, oh, the coming months or half year, I want to try something out. One of those things is also, I wanted to give something back to uh, open source because we've all been using open source for a long time. And I sometimes feel a bit guilty about all the good things I get for free, looking at other people's code, but also all the functionality you get for free this way. And the issue I also had is how, how can I give this back? 
because you can just start sending in issues, but then you first need to find one. You, you can uh, also supply code to uh, open source, but yeah, which project should I pick? I don't know yet. And there's probably a lot more better developers than me also picking stuff up and already doing that. So why would I join at that point? And one of the issues that, well, I discussed this with my colleagues as well, is, is don't do open source to make your curriculum vitae or your resume uh, look better. It's, it will bite you. If you commit to open sourcing something, a library that's used by many other people that's taking complexity away, do keep that up. Do something that you will actually enjoy for the coming year or years. And that will help you make, well, help other people uh, improve using that library. So, ING does do open source a tiny bit. We do a lot of inner sourcing. However, I'm not going to talk about an ING library that I open sourced. Does anyone know this game, by the way? Let's do see some hands. Okay, sure, let's go. I will explain the next sheet what it is, so don't worry. Um, it is a game where you basically, basically uh, build up a character, uh, improve your statistics, and you can show that off. There's also speed runs that try to achieve a certain goal within a certain amount of time. Those are streamed. And I figured if I can read save games, this game is originally 24 years old now. So all the, the, the tip bits, the difficulties have already been discovered and worked out by people. So it should be fairly easy to actually combine all the data and share it on a screen. That's what I worked out here. You can see both on the left and right, there's data from the character running around. It's updated every couple of minutes because they don't update it all the time. So this game is called Diablo and they rebuild it, so it's called Resurrected. Your main goal is beat the bad guy, get items, improve, and over time, it's, it's a bit of a gamble, but it does make you feel rewarding once you continue to play it. And people still play this game after 24 years, even now. So, challenges I've had, and that, that's because if something is easy to do, you don't have to build a library. But some of the issues that you have, and there's already existing libraries that they don't calculate well, is if you add all those items, those items have item bonuses, those combined, that's also what keeps the game interesting for people that still play it. The, this is Diablo 2. Diablo 3 and 4 have already been released and less and less people are playing that and they keep on playing this for some strange reason. But those bonuses add up. So how do you calculate that? How do you test that? And how do you display that? So that's what I also had to figure out and also um, do a lot of testing around that. Um, one of the interesting issues I ran into was the personalization name because the game is built in C, C++, and those strings are zero terminated, so that should be easy if you scan a save game file, but if it's the maximum length, it's not terminated. So if you start reading on, you'll read the wrong bytes. That's actually one of the issues that I've had because you don't read bytes, you actually read bits, and those bits are also in the wrong order, which I will also cover here. Um, some of the Difficulties I had initially was, okay, I'm just going to open source a little bit and it's fine, and it's simple. But are you going to open source also translations, for example? Will you include those or will you leave it up to uh, the people who use your library? Um, or are you just giving them a, a nice interface to connect to? Just give me the save game and you get some statistics back. That was quite a challenge to figure out. Like, hmm, where do I stop? Because the more you do within your library, the more complexity you get, and the more maintenance you will get. Um, the license was another issue because I, there were some existing libraries to do this, including in Java. One was quite old, was built in Java 8. A lot of uh, modern ones were built in JavaScript. Th those have more functionality and some of those have different licenses. So if you use some of their parts, you should copy their license. So in the end, I ended up with a lesser GPL 2.1, but anyone who uses my library can use an Apache license or BSD, whatever they prefer for their uh, view. But it took me well a couple of days to figure out like hmm, which license should I use for this part because I don't want to cause any issues for people that say hey you have to take your code down now because we don't agree with your license. That's the, the issue with many of the more restrictive uh, open source licenses. Um, the other challenge that 
will also be covered later on is like where where are you going to release this and, and how do you do that in an easy way so people can actually use it uh, without having to jump to too many hoops so as i just mentioned it's a bit of a jump but um Java reads bytes in Big Endian, and most of the C, C++, uh, C Sharp also, I think, is Little Endian, which means it's in the, the other order. So if you start reading bits in those bytes, you will get completely different numbers, and it's a big mess to figure out what's going on. That was quite a puzzle to figure out, what should I do now? Um, and as mentioned, their bit values. So they had a couple of updates as well on the save games, and then at that point the bit values also move around, and you have to figure out again, like, oh shit, what's going on here? So one of those issues that I had was that um, they moved one bit, one position, and thereby if you kept reading those uh, items, it went off. Uh, so I had to add ex eight extra bits, one byte, to make it work again, but only on specific, I think, three or four items. All the other ones were fine. And it was also locked as well. So if it does break again, I will have a quick reminder like, hey, I have to look at this and I can adjust it on this specific item. Um, another issue I had is, is well, um, am I going to use my real name? Uh, am I going to do it anonymous? Um, I used a nickname I've been using for quite some time now. Um, as mentioned, some people in the gaming community are quite opinionated or attached. I've had an issue like 20 years ago when I first played this game with an American guy who was boasting a bit. He claimed to have a Ferrari, which turned out to be a Pontiac Fiero of 15,000 euro. Uh, he claimed to have invented DB2, and those were the arguments he used, like, hey, I'm right, you're wrong, and I am an expert because I have this. Well, he did it with two Dutchmen around, and Dutch people are quite direct. They will just tell him, no, that's uh, insane, you're not right, and uh, try to find some real arguments. But after a couple of months, he started to actually threaten to come visit us and say hi. I don't mind that too much because it's just someone with a big mouth online. If you do feel concerned about that and you don't want to be anonymous, uh, you can. Or if you don't want your employer to know about it, because you can do stuff like uh, Nintendo emulation. That might be a legal issue as well or something that's confronting. And at that point, you can decide, I don't want to do anything uh, with my name attached. In my case, this was easy because most people playing this game, um, they know me by this nickname. Actually, last Sunday, I was in a Twitch stream with about 2,000 Dutch people, and I said something, and one guy came up like, hey, you're the other Diablo fanatic here, and that's within 2,000 people. So actually, people can relate to you. That's why I picked my nickname to, to support this part. Um, I released two libraries, actually a third one as well. That's the, an application that I'll show later on as well. Um, and I also added examples, because I think if you want people to use your library, um, you should give them examples. You should write proper documentation. Um, but do not release something at Christmas Eve, uh, an hour before you have dinner. Yeah. That was my 100 version. I tried to keep everything under my nickname, and then I accidentally uh, committed and tagged the 10 version, which, because I deleted the previous one, also shared my computer type and my domain. So if this is a Git issue. If, if you do this kind of stuff, you want to be fully anonymous, you can, but do be careful with these kind of things. It was quite funny. I, I don't mind too much that it's shared, but it, I thought it was funny to actually add, if you do want to do it anonymous, keep this in mind. So the maintenance part is also documentation, as I just mentioned. You can tell people, yeah, just read the code, uh, just use my library and done. But if you want people to actually use your code, use your uh, um, um, library efficiently, then you should go beyond that. And for me, that was also extending myself in, in technical writing, because that's something we are lacking often as developers. So I could fiddle around with Javadoc, which nowadays I use Java 21 for this. It's quite workable. We do get some new stuff coming along, I think in Java 23 or 24, that will make it even better and easier for us as developers. You can use Markdown at that point within your code as well. Um, as mentioned, I had a, a, a example project, so people, if they're interested, they can look at the code and run it themselves, and then it should be easier for them to actually use the code in the library as well. I copied that from Spring because they also do that. I thought that, that might be a good thing to do. Um, we had a talk earlier by Antonio about um, architectural decision records. 
Um, I tend to call them marked on any decision record because I don't want everything to be architectural, but um, anything that you shouldn't know about if you start working on code or start contributing, I think that's very beneficial. I'm actually also marking this within ING, within our engineering teams, like you should start using this. But at that point, you do include those document, this documentation with your code. So we don't have any central uh, repository that says these things. Um, I will, I can actually show you now if my screen works. Um, it's perfect. Um, so in this case, the decision was made to make it read-only. I did get some comments on that from people who wanted to use my library, like, hey, why can't I write with this? Because I have this in this use case. I didn't realize that. Also, read-only is much, much easier because you don't have to collect all the data you don't know or you don't use. So I might extend upon that with a later version to also support writing. It's called, also called parser, so read-only makes sense. So I don't want to repeat Antonio's talk too much, but basically you consider options, you write why you made a decision. And also if you come back to this like half a year or a year afterwards, you have an easy argument at that point to pick the alternative because you've already looked at them. Let's go back to. So maintenance is also important because this might be there for a couple of years. And you can, of course, use all those uh, central products in the cloud. I am using GitHub, so I, I could easily just use the GitHub uh, solutions for this. But also locally and also within our projects, we also run this uh, dependency. You can just run it on your PC. I do think it's quite useful. This one is the one I usually use because it displays uh, the, the updates. If you want to, you can also tell it to update them but sometimes it will update things to a alpha or beta version. And well, I work for a bank, we don't want those versions. So I usually add those by hand. If you do this regularly, then maybe you do it once a week or twice uh, uh, a month. You don't have to do too much work, but it does keep your versions up to date. It does filter out any issues that you have. So and it's actually quite easy. I just mentioned uh, Open Rewrite as well as an example. Um, some of them, well, I mentioned Java 1721, but I've also used it to correct my package name because I was silly enough to name my package com github instead of io github. And I could just change it in all files or I could run open rewrite and it's done within a few seconds for me. Along with the, once I picked a license, I could add a license header and I was able to remove any unused imports. The reason why I would use open rewrite for this is if other people will submit um, merge requests for me, I can run the open rewrite recipes on them. So you have one structured piece of code. This is quite useful if you have a lot of developers working on your code and they might have different setups or different orderings within import. That's something that you can also fix with open rewrite. If you don't know the tool, go check it out because it's really quite powerful and useful. Um, community building is, is a difficult part because I do have some users of course, but you know, there are maybe at the moment still 40,000 people worldwide, 50,000 perhaps playing the game. That's not a big audience. It's not like millions of people. So you do have to look at who am I targeting? Well, it's both developers and that's of course the people who use the, the developers products on the library. It's the library itself doesn't do anything. It's just a piece of code that you call. So the developers, they can to be like, hey, can I also write stuff? Um, they just need a simple interface. And if they want extra stuff added, they will come to me with requests. And that's different from the actual users because they just tell me, I just want the data and uh, I will do my own markup, make it look good on screen. Just as long as I have this specific data, I'm fine with it. It was quite interesting. I didn't expect it to happen. I just figured like, oh, well, that the developers will do that and they will talk to their users. Instead, the users also came to me like, hey, can you supply this to me and that to me? So they have a better, clearer overview and they can use this in speed runs to actually um, display it well, but also figure out if items are illegal because sometimes speed runs are done with prepared items. Those are sort of hacked in, in perfect uh, statistics. And we had one case where people forgot to add a naming field that broke. 
So they used my library to also check um, once they fixed that if all the files were correct. For publishing, um, I figured I can just look for something myself or I can just walk to some students and ask them, hey, what are you using nowadays? And almost all students come up to me like, hey, yeah, we use Jetpack. It's so easy. You just make an account, you upload it, and it's done. And it's free, so why not? One of the downsides is you do have to add another repo to your uh, Gradle or POM file to include, and that does need, um, it, it's not coming from Maven Central. And what's really unclear for me is like, who are you? I can do this really anonymously. So they have no check at all. I, I'm not even sure if they check the code for malware or whatever, or old versions that have the security leaks. You can just up, you upload a jar and that's it. And tell people, oh, you can download it there. That's it. And because my code was on GitHub, I thought, no, oh, well, let's also check GitHub packages because GitHub advertises it that it's also free for open source. And they're supporting open source. Easy to integrate, that's one of the, the nice parts because it's already in GitHub, I can use GitHub Actions and just publish it once. This does have the same issue as the, the JPEG I just mentioned, including that you need the uh, GitHub token. So you need uh, a valid GitHub account and those need to be updated every month. For a library that's quite annoying because how often are you going to download that new version? So every time you will try to figure out, hey, I need to find a new one, it will do a call to GitHub and you will need to update your token each month. The other part, and I still haven't found exactly what they're doing. I don't know how well they scan the repository. Can I actually upload malware or not? I don't want to try this out with my own account. Maybe I should make a template account for that. But no one has, has been able to tell me yet, like, yeah, they're doing security checks, it's fine. Everyone says, yeah, I don't know. So I do hope soon I will find out what they actually do about this because they should, GitHub is quite important for a lot of people. They should also, they do have a lot of tooling to scan for things. I do hope they also scan for the GitHub packages on this. And well, the final one that people told me, oh, you shouldn't do this. It, it's insane. It's complex. Um, apparently difficult to set up. Um, but it is Maven Central. So once it's in there, Anyone can use it. You can use it. Uh, it's just three lines in your, your Maven palm or your in Gradle, and you can just get it. You don't have to do anything about it. You don't have any account needed. But the original was a challenge, as mentioned. Um, the complexities on why this is, there's a great talk you can find on YouTube by Jamie Coleman, The Secret Life of Maven Central. He covers all the reasons why they are doing a lot of checks, why it's difficult, why it's complex to do so. And the benefits are clear. We, we almost don't see any malware coming by because it's already filtered out by Maven Central, by Sonotype. But they did discontinue the old service they had. So the, the one that's been around for, I think, 20 years has been discontinued as of March this year. When I started building my code, they already were uh, doing some alpha beta testing and I joined the, the beta at that point and I started using it. That was one of my challenges. I ran into many guys and plugins. So anything before March this year, um, do check very well if it's proper, if you're going to do this, or if it's still something old, because I did run into many issues. That, so that you also could see when I failed to publish my 100 well, that was caused by outdated documentation. And just ignore the old guides, look for new ones. They are coming up a lot lately, so the modern documentation is quite well, actually. So Maven Central is still Maven Central. They just gave it a different name. It's now called Sonotype Central if you publish, um, but that's it. So before you had your own account or a company account. Nowadays, you can also use Google to log in. And of course, you can use GitHub. And GitHub has the main benefit that if you use GitHub, it automatically reserves your domain. If you don't use GitHub, you have to actually prove that the domain is owned by you. So if I would published for ING Italy, I would need to upload a file at ING IT and they would uh, get that, verify that I own the domain and at that point I can start uploading for that domain. So it, it's all on the root domain um, that you're um, sharing your packages on. And well, GitHub makes it a lot easier. Um, the, the requirements, they are actually the same, but the interface is modernized, it's simpler, the downside is the plugins 
they're based on the old interface that we had and they are currently still being updated. I think the current version is still 0 0.40. I started with 0, 0.0 something. Uh, they are adding a lot of stuff. They are making improvements, but it's not fully up to date yet in what we had before. That part is improving slowly. So the requirements that you have, and that's what also people told me, this will be complex for you. You need to own the domain, but that makes sense. You want to prove that you are, you don't want any other company or hacker uh, produce artifacts in your name that are downloaded from Maven Central without any uh, check or whatever. So if you own the domain, you control also the files stored there. So all those files, if you look at the GitHub packages and uh, JIPPack, they don't have all these checks in them. They only have a jar file and it's in some cases just fine. Um, Maven Central does tell you to use, well, the form makes sense, of course, because it's Maven. The Java doc, I think you only need to file. So if you just add a small zip, then I think you'll get through. I did add a lot of Java doc because I also want to train my technical writing. And you need the sources. So that's one um, immutable block that they will um, hold for you at that point. You can use multiple ways to actually sign your packages or the checksums. The MD5 and SHA-1 are mandatory. I think 2.5.6 and 5.12 are also supported. So if you want to have a more secure package, then also you can just supply those. You won't be declined if you don't deliver them, but it might be some extra added security that might help out. So my main concern was the uh, signing of the files and that's done by PGP or as they put it in the URL GPG because that's the GNU version. That document that's linked here, I will share it later on as well, is actually, it's a lot of text. But once you follow that, my concerns were gone, it's actually quite easy to follow. And it, it's quite clear, I didn't run into any issues. If you do run into issues, they have explanations. What do you need to do? They have to upload also a certificate to uh, Ubuntu or some other um, key sharing service that, that's uh, available online, public. Once you do that and you sign the files with this, then it's fine and you can upload because they can at that point validate that the files are actually signed by you as a developer. These are all the layers of security they've built into Maven Central and have been around for many years already. That's also why Maven Central is that good. The other thing you need to keep in mind, and that's also why at a certain point I had to figure out, oh damn, which license should I use? Um, develop information is easy. You can just use a Gmail address, but the license information has to be complete as well. And they will tag you for it within the, the Sonotype website. Um, one thing to keep in mind, if you do manual uploads and you did so in the past, that's changed. They changed the layout to include the, the full package tree. So your old zip files, if you had scripts for that or plugins for that, they don't work anymore. It's one of the uh, things mentioned. Uh, they updated their plugins. It's going slowly, but this part is working fine already for quite some time. And one thing to keep in mind is if it's published, it stays published. Unless you did some really hacky stuff and copyright infringement, that kind of things, then they can still remove it. But typically the version that you uploaded, the version has to be unique as well. That will stay there. Uh, well, they claim forever. You know how forever goes, but it is there. So if you do make mistakes, I don't want to upload too many versions as well. So just make sure before you release it, it's actually quite workable. I have seen people in a previous company I worked for upload every uh, beta they made. And it's, it's multiple times a day. And after a while, then your repository is gigantic. So don't do that to Maven Central. The process itself wasn't that bad, actually. Um, my idea was I would just use the Maven uh, release plugin and um, do a Maven release prepare, Maven release uh, perform. You get the versions, everything is committed. You could see that as well, the tag is being made. And well, the version I did two weeks ago, it failed with a 500 service error. And unfortunately it didn't specify any uh, other details because if I can just do this, I can, with two commands, I can release my version. It's that easy. The only thing I had to do was all the previous work, set up my um, uh, PGP token, and that's it. So once this is working, I'm still in contact with them to have this resolved. I can just use one or two commands to actually release the software. And I have no worries anymore. So for now, what I did, because I did release my versions already, 
Um, I run the plugin. I get the bundle zip. You can also do that manually, of course, but why would you if the plugin already does it for you? You go to their portal. You upload the file. Because it, it already knows who you are. In my case, because I'm, I use the IO GitHub, I use my GitHub login as well. So they know I am uh, who I say I am. They will check the file for you. And that will, will typically take a couple of minutes. Once it's validated, you start publishing. And again, it takes a couple of minutes. You can get a cup of coffee. And then it's there. And from that point on, any laptop, any PC you have, you can run it and you will get the, the jar file or jar files if you have those uh, to your PC and you can, you can start building up on it. So there's no longer a Maven install uh, local needed. You can just use Maven Central at that point. So the takeaways, many people warn me, oh, this will be a month project. You will run into so many complexities, uh, things to figure out. You have to read so many guides. I actually had to push myself to read less guides because many of the guides, they are no longer useful. Really keep that in mind. If you do want to do this, ignore any old guides. They will be there for the coming 10 years probably. Look for updated ones. The library itself was also quite challenging because you have to think about licenses, but also what am I going to share? I can also show you some parts of the um, uh, implementation I did. Um, also, what kind of applications do you want to build yourself? Are you just doing a library or also are you going to build code? Initially, I was just going to build an application and figured, oh, this might be a nice library because I have a lot of complexities I need to resolve. How can I share that with the rest of the people and also well, see how they uh, improve at that point? The, um, as mentioned, the older art articles, uh, just ignore them. The, the new documentation that they have a Maven Central or Sonotype Central, sorry, um, is actually quite good. They've updated it the past months, I think since around February, they are almost fully complete. So anything you find there, any issue you have, you can find the documentation nowadays. It's coming along quite well. As mentioned, the GPG part, it's really good. You just read it, you follow it, and the complex part at that point is made simple by just following the guide. And if you do run into issues, there are easy resolves at that point to figure out what to do. Um, as mentioned, the tooling, the plugins are being developed. I do hope they will end up at 1.0 some, sometime soon. Some parts are still not fully functional. As, as you saw, the, the 500 service error is not, there's no, no mention what, whatever what's going on. Did I make a mistake in my POM? Did, is it my GitHub connection? I don't know. So if that can be clarified, I can actually resolve it and then do things uh, automatically with one command. And for me, the, the supporting community is still a bit difficult. I do have, I think about eight developers now looking at my code. What can we do with it? Can we actually build an application with it? And there's many more users because, well, the, it is something to display, and of course, there's a market for that. The functionality there is still a bit of a challenge, like, how can I help you out? Or will I just tell you to connect to the uh, other developers who are also building things at the moment, including a Grail uh, Hunter, which means that you collect all the items in the game and then mark them as found. If you can do that automatically, you no longer have to do that manually and for someone sharing stuff or just playing by themselves. That does save a lot of effort. So I will switch to code. Let's see, this is the library itself. The examples, I've built this part, um, just the documentation. I do mention you need Java 21. That was a challenge for me, like, am I going to force my users to actually move to Java 21? But if you don't force this Java version, you don't get all the nice benefits. I also use the Java 21 things I built as examples to other colleagues, other developers, um, telling them we have to move to 21. There's a lot of benefits. We, we, the code is not just getting more interesting, but it's also more efficient, especially in memory usage. And this is a nice example to, at that point, show. Even because it's open source, so you can just send them a link. Here's the, the interesting code, and I can just talk you through it. One of the um, examples you see here is that you pass the, this is a short demo, so I hope it doesn't break. 
Nice, it's working. So what I did here, and that's also one of the things I've built into my example, is how can I translate those files? So they are actually using the Italian uh, names and showing you in which uh, file they are located. So if you're playing a lot and you need to figure out where to find the, um, the documentation or, or the, the, the uh, items, and you have like hundreds of files, which in some cases is quite normal, then those will help you, okay, I need to open this character to find my information. And they do allow a lot of uh, languages, so I'm just with a simple piece of code showing you how to do that. Um, no, not this one, sorry. I didn't have it open. No. Um, another thing I built is that I actually shared a um, application to display the statistics. I'll quickly go back in my talk. There you go. So the um, part you see right on top of me um, has statistics displayed. That's built natively with Quarkus. It starts up in, I think, 20 milliseconds, and it uses 50 megabytes of memory and it's all native and it's Java. And the whole file itself is 50 megabytes, which if I zip it, is 25 megabytes. If you compare this to any solution with JavaScript, it's slower, it uses a lot more memory, and it actually uses a lot more space um, as a file as well. Plus you get all the dependencies you get with, with JavaScript. And the JavaScript solutions that they have at the moment, they are not complete. They are uh, displaying errors as well in statistics. And this is a good alternative for them to actually use. And I've built tests around it to keep this up to date. So if they do patch, which they did two weeks ago, within a minute, I will know, did I break something? Is everything still fine? And I can adjust the code if needed. So since we're running around, any questions? Because that's my final page. The page after this has the links, by the way, so if you're looking for them, then. Any questions from the public? Go ahead. How many hours did I spend on the game? Well, that's very confronting. I, I, I would say, if, because I do play it a lot, and I did play it a lot, and it's old, it's probably over 20,000 hours. I'm not a competitive speedrunner, but um, I do know the game quite well, and I just play it for fun. So it's still fun for me, so I do keep on playing it. Um, yes, go ahead. That's a very good question. I'm going to open the source code again. So the question is, how do you protect yourself with licenses against legal issues? Um, because, oops, where's my, this is the correct license. This is the normal license. So, straight, yeah. This is the LGPL. It's 2.1, it's not 3.1 or 3.0 because, well, the original code, Java 8 was 2.1, so I kept that. I didn't want to, cause issues there, but I'm also adding files that are part of the game. And I did add at that point, like these files might be copyrighted. They are not in the jar file I upload to Maven Central. So you have to copy those by yourself if you want to use it. I also leave it up to developers to do that. Um, and if there is an issue, then uh, well, stop doing it. I haven't had any uh, takedown out so far. So, but it, these are shared with, by a lot of other people as well. So there's probably not an issue, but just in case you can add this kind of disclaimers. So if there is an issue, we don't think there is, but if there is, then we will take it down and then it's resolved. At that point, I can just add instructions for those people to create those files by themselves because you just can. Um, and then that part is resolved. Of course, things like Nintendo or, or using copyrighted material like uh, Mario in, a, in a, is an image that, that's uh, an issue. Another question.
Okay. So the question is that, uh, migration Java 1721 uh, using Open Write and, and how much easier was it? It took me less than a minute. And that's that's it. That's it. What it does do, um, and for those that don't know Open Rewrite or don't know it well, um, it has multiple sub recipes, including one that fixed some of my tests to the list that get first instead of list that get a zero. Um, it also gives you, and that's one of the main things I really like about Open Rewrite. It also gives you suggestions if you do migrate to 21, what new things are there. So if you didn't read up fully, or well, it's been a while, for example, if you go from Java 8 to 11 or 11 to 17 or 21, it will show you some of the improvements in the language. It also helped me out with some of the string uh, displays. That was, oh yeah, I can use it like this. Um, and in, in that aspect, I do think uh, Open Rewrite, even if you don't fully want to use it, it does give a lot of nice suggestions. And for me, the migration was really simple. We have five minutes left, I think. Okay. Then I will show one more, oh, one question. Yep. No, no. Um, yeah. So the question is, if you use Open Rewrite, uh, is it applied only once, or let me see if I can actually find it in my code. No, that's not it. Where's my Open Rewrite? Mm, where's the parser? It's a plugin that you add, and um, within your plugin, you add which ones you want to run. There you go. Yep. Almost. Come on, I need you somewhere, right? There you go. Ah, IntelliJ is being annoying. So what you do here, I, I currently only have the upgrade to 21 included, but you can of course also do the rewrite to package name. You can order the, the imports in all Java files as well. You add those here. It doesn't run all the time. It runs when you call it. So you actually have to run a Maven command to trigger the plugin. That's the way you resolve it. So that's also when someone does a uh, pull request or merge request to me, I can at that point run or ask them to run the Maven rewrite on top of it and everything will be in the same type and style. And I think that's the main benefit also for companies with a lot of, uh, for example, in a source, you definitely benefit at that point. So quick in between, so two minutes, I think. Uh, I did a run with uh, uh, perfected items. And the idea was to do three classes and then do different uh, styles. And well, I got a big red error while playing. And then you're an engineer, so you stop playing and you start looking at the error, of course. And um, as you can see where the white arrow is, um, it had an issue with index 247, which well, if you do know some bytes or the power of twos, then you will think, hey, this is something to do with certain amount of bits that are incorrectly filled. As it turned out, someone had seven uh, ones filled in instead of a proper number that broke. And it turned out that the entire run done at that point by I think 20 people was void for all of them because they used illegal items. So this was the cause. You see a grand charm on the top left and this is how it should look. So one of those items was properly well made. They make these items in an editor and then they are legally findable, but they create them so you can actually use them. And this was the cause. It's quite silly. So afterwards, I also checked all the um, stash files and the ones they have now are properly. So for those who want to have a link, or if you have any questions that you don't want to ask here or think of when you're going home or walk by afterwards, um, you can poke me on one of the blue things like Twitter or blue sky, whatever. I also have DMs open if you are a bit uh, unsure about it. And my sheets and talks will also be online. And typically, if there's a video uploaded, we also share it with IMG. One more question in the back, then I'll finish up. Mm -hmm. I know. <laughs> Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So for those online and in the recording, uh, Andres points out that there's a tool called JReleaser that also resolves a lot of the challenges that I had. And yeah, I should definitely check that out. I, I did know about it, but I didn't use it yet. So that's a good excuse, I guess. Thank you all. And well, let's move on to the next session, I would say.